Um, so let's turn our attention now to what we know about APA um, in terms of writing conventions and how to go about structuring a literature review. Actually, just structuring, uh, in all honesty, writing in general. Now, these are the ones that on the handout that you've got, you know, the writing is kind of small, so don't worry about it. Like I say, when I upload them online, it'll be one slide per page, so don't worry about actually writing what I've got there. Just sort of jot note down what the important points are here. So the first thing, and this is something that, while I didn't correct in anybody's annotation, I will note that just about every annotation I previewed did this incorrectly. APA says is that if you can put something at a given place in time, it is written about in the past tense. So anything that's published, we can actually put in a, at a place in time. And if it has been published, it means it has happened in the past. So we talk about it as if it's written in the past. So the authors didn't think this, and they didn't state that, and they didn't write this. They thought it. They reported it. They wrote it. All of those things need to go in the past tense. You know, so if you look at the example here, Dean Bennett of the Canadian Press asked his readers. Then he proceeded to do this. Uh, he further predicted. You know, all of these things are in the past tense because we can put it at a given place and time. The same thing will happen not just in your literature review. So if you're thinking about it in terms of as I'm working on my thesis, what that means is that Almost everything in chapter 1 is going to be written about in the past tense. Everything in chapter 2 is going to be written about in the past tense. For your eventual thesis, so the one that you submit as the final product in 6190, everything in chapter 3 is going to be written about in the past tense. For, or sorry, for 691. For 690, you know, if you think about this in terms of an iterative process, essentially you're writing a draft of chapter 2 now. That's all in the past tense. In 690, we're going to be writing drafts of chapter 1. We're going to be revising our chapter 2. And we're also going to be writing chapter 3. Now, your methodology chapter at that point is still a proposal. So what's going to happen is for 690, chapter 3 is actually mostly going to be written about in the future tense. Because you are going to survey somebody. And you're going to observe this. And you're going to interview that. And you're going to answer these research questions. And you're going to analyze the data using X, Y, and Z. When we get to 691, you'll have done all of those things. So chapter 3 is going to be turned into the past tense. Because you will have collected the data. You will have interviewed people. You will have analyzed the data at that stage. You will have answered your research questions. Even chapter 4, when you get to 691, your findings, all of those things are things that you found from your research study. You found them in the data that was collected in the past. So chapter 4 is going to be written about in the past tense. If you think of chapter 5 again as that conclusions and implications section, those three purposes that we talked about, the summary part, that's going to be in the past tense. You know, because it's talking about, essentially, you're summarizing everything that, you know, you found in your study. The implications for practice, probably in the present tense, because you're basically saying, you know, based on what I found, this is what I think teachers should do. Avenues for future research is going to be in the future tense, obviously. You know, essentially, someone who does a study on this topic next should research X or should research Y. You know, so if you think about this in terms of your five chapters of your eventual product, the vast majority of this is going to be written in the past tense because we can put it at a specific place in time. You know, the easy way of thinking about it is if you can date it, you write about it in the past tense. You know, so if you can assign a specific date to it, either because it has a specific date or because you know when it happened. So you think about like your methods section, you know, in your eventual document, you know when that happened. You collected your data in August. You're now writing in November. Actually, October, hopefully. Maybe even September. Late September, hopefully. So, you write in the past tense. For the purposes of 689, your literature review is going to be completely in the past tense, save maybe the introduction to it. 
And in the introduction part, and it'll actually be the next slide, is probably the only place where you will um, hit maybe present tense or future tense. Um, but it's on the next slide here. So the next thing that you should do in any research study, and I would recommend that you do it as a part of your um, literature reviews, is essentially tell the reader how you're defining certain terms. You know, many terms that we have out there in education have multiple definitions, or in some cases, there is a particular researcher that you've read that has operationalized that particular term in a specific way that, you know, speaks to you. You know, you want to act, you know, tell the reader, usually in the introduction or as a second section of your literature review, what those definitions that you are using are. So in this case, for example, you know, I talk about a couple of different definitions of virtual schooling. You know, I talk about one that was written by Clark 2000. I also talk about one that was written by Russell 2004. You know, in my case, I looked at it and said, well, Clark limits his definition of virtual schooling to only secondary schools, and I didn't want to do that. So for that reason, in this case, I'm going to use Russell's definition in this particular article as the one that I'm going to accept for virtual schooling. So I give a couple of definitions, and then I say, this is the one I'm choosing and why. You don't have to be this detailed in all honesty. In fact, if you come across any of the dissertations you've had, often at the end of chapter one, there's a full section, sometimes five, six, ten pages long, called definition of terms, where they actually go through and give a term and then provide the definition that they are using for their dissertation study. You want to provide a methodology in the exact same way that we have a full chapter that gives a methodology for our study. A literature review isn't just, oh, I'm going out and looking at what I can find. It should be a systematic review of the literature. The key term there is systematic. You want to describe what that systematicness looks like. You know, what is the actual process that you undertook to generate the specific terms, or sorry, the specific literature that you have. Where did you look? What were the range of dates that you looked? What kinds of search terms that you, did you use? You know, how did you come up on those things? You know, so if you look at the example that I've got here, and I know on your handouts it's kind of small, and for that matter, even up here it's not the biggest, but I basically start off by saying, I started looking through this literature in 2004. I stopped looking in 2008. So I actually spent four years examining the literature that was here. I looked through, uh, let's see, Eric, JSTOR, PsycInfo, Wilson Webb, as some of the databases, because it says um, online databases available through a research university library system, because you're not supposed to say which one because um, that might identify the author in it. It was from the University of Georgia, because that's where I did my doctorate. And then I list off a sampling of some of the main databases in education that they would have housed. You know, I also consulted like my colleagues, specifically folks that were presented at the Virtual School Symposium and at the annual meeting of AERA and at the annual meeting of SITE. Because a lot of what they were telling me were things that weren't in peer-reviewed journals, and a lot of it had been disseminated through private research centers, there were evaluations or doctoral dissertations. In addition to these formal databases, I also used Google in general, and specifically Google Scholar. I specifically tell them that I use that as a supplementary source, so it wasn't my primary source. This stuff up here was my primary source. And I use these kinds of terms, including but not limited to. So that's not an exhaustive list, but those are the terms that generated the most useful results for me in terms of finding things. Right? Where did I search? What did the process look like in terms of timing? How did I go about finding things in terms of the terms or in terms of like-minded colleagues? The only thing that I'm really missing here, in all honesty, is a range of dates that I was searching. Now, in my case, I, didn't, I wasn't limiting myself. 
Um, you know, I was in a relatively new field and having a hard time finding good results in the first place. So it's not like I was only looking for from 1990 to 2010. You will often see included in this kind of paragraph that kind of language. I think if, remember, if we looked at the, um, the educational research, educational practice article that uh, the guys up in Montreal wrote at Laval and Concordia, I think in their literature review they included a range of dates that they were looking at from this date to this date. So that's the only kind of thing that's missing in there that you might often see. Now, if you didn't limit yourself in terms of dates, you know, if you were looking for the entire wealth of information that's on your topic, not just the recent stuff, then, you know, like I was, don't include dates. Um, you know, but if you are looking and, you know, limiting yourself by date, you might want to include that in there. In addition to providing a methodology, one of the things that you will often see when you're looking at a literature review is they will provide a purpose for the literature review or they will provide specific questions that they're trying to answer from the literature. You know, so these are the five questions that I was trying to answer for actually the second half of my dissertation. This was came from one of the articles I published from it first half of my literature review I didn't publish because it was sort of old hat at that stage. But this half, because my essentially I asked eight questions of the literature for my literature review. These five I ended up publishing in an article afterwards. You know, again, if you look at the examples that we had today, again, the guys from um, Montreal, you'll note... When they look at this, I'm trying to find the line here now. They don't give a question, they give a purpose. And I'm trying to find where it is here. The purpose of the research? Was the purpose of the literature review. Uh, it's at the very bottom of page three. The following section briefly summarizes the empirical studies of the use of research by educational practitioners and factors affecting its use. This use, sorry. All right, so that's the purpose of their, it's in the educational research and educational practice article. All right, so when you're looking at that, essentially as a way of introducing their literature review, although they do it at the very end of their introduction as opposed to the very beginning of their literature review, they tell you essentially what the purpose of their literature review is. So you know right off the bat that they're only looking for two things. They're looking for research that looks at the use of research by educational practitioners <coughs> and research that examines factors that affect that use. And they're not just looking for general research, they actually want empirical studies. So if they found a lit review article, they were excluding it. Now they don't do a good job in terms of giving us a methodology, in terms of how they went about finding all of the literature that they had. But they do give us a very specific purpose. You know, because theirs was a very short purpose, it's actually much better much more concise to write in that one sentence than it would be to ask those things in the form of questions of the literature. For most theses and dissertations that I see, I often see these kinds of questions. You know, so at the end of the introduction section of chapter two, I'll often see, you know, these are the questions that I asked of the literature. Particularly if there's more than two you know, if it's something, if it's one or two things that you're asking of the literature, that's usually something that can be summarized neatly in a sentence like these guys did. This wouldn't be something I could neatly summarize in a single sentence or two. Right? I could do it in five sentences pretty easy. You know, maybe even four considering that I'm looking at benefits and challenges. You know, I could probably combine those two into a single sentence. You know, but this is kind of you know, to turn this into prose would be basically a paragraph. 
And if I'm going to spend a full paragraph on it, this is much quicker and takes up less, less words. These guys, however, because they're only looking at two things, and their descriptors for those two things are short of short, they can put it in prose fairly succinctly. Either of these things are good. You know, so if I see this kind of thing in your lit review come May 3rd, is it May 3rd? Six? May 3rd. 3rd. May 3rd. That's fine. If I see this, that's perfectly fine as well. I want to see one or the other. Following along here now, your introduction, probably going to give some general brief information in your first paragraph. Your next paragraph or two is probably going to provide essentially the methodology, you know, the process that you went through. You're going to finish that introduction with essentially the purpose of your literature review or the questions you're asking of the literature. Right? That's going to be, say, the first page, page and a half of your literature review there, minus that first paragraph or two, which you know, provides sort of an introduction to your topic. Basically, you're going to introduce the topic. You're going to give me the process or methodology that you went through, and then you're going to give me the purpose or the questions. So basically, you're going to give me the last two slides that we just talked about, Plus, you're going to start off by telling me what it is you're actually studying. You know, because you're not going to start off by just saying, well, I've reviewed this, that, and, you know, there's the process I went through. I need a paragraph or two that tells me I'm interested in professional development or co-teaching or, um, you know, PBIS or what are, you know, magnet schools, you know, and tells me, you know, at least a couple of sentences about what that is. One of my biggest pet peeves and one of the marks of a poor writer is someone that uses literature in isolation. What I mean by that is you look at a paragraph, and in that paragraph they talk about one person. And then when you look at the next paragraph, they talk about the next piece of literature. And then you look at the next paragraph, and they talk about the next piece of literature. You have to group the sources by common themes. Well, not just common or... themes, but you have to talk about them together because it shows your ability to include essentially to understand and internalize the topic so that you're not just talking about individuals. So, you know, if you look at this example, you know, again, it's a little bit smaller, and in all honesty, I'll be perfectly honest and say that, you know, it's not necessarily the best example. I would use this as what you would consider in most cases an exemplar, a typical example. I can find a lot better ones out there. I picked this one purposefully because... This is sort of at the level that I would expect from you guys, both as a product from 689 as well as your eventual thesis. You'll see some really good examples in actually what we've published here. Even the studies that we said where the study was a little bit questionable, the literature review is much better. I'll point out a couple of examples here. But what you see here is in this particular paragraph, I'm just looking at one of the specific benefits. You know, I start off by saying, Probably the most often cited benefit of virtual schooling is the first listed by Berg and Clark, 2005. And in the previous paragraph in the article, I would listed off what the five benefits were. The first one I said is probably the most often cited. And then what you see is I talk about that one from multiple sources. So Kavanaugh, 2001, talks about it this way. Um, Friedman, Darrow, Watson, and Lorenz talk about it this way. Uh, where's my next one here? Hernandez, 2005, talks about it this way. So I'm taking a particular issue, and I'm showing how I understand and how multiple people have talked about that particular issue. That would be very different than saying, okay, Kavanaugh here talks about three of the five, you know, three of the five benefits. Let me tell you about them. And Friedman et al. talk about four of the benefits. Let me tell you about those four. That's disjointed. You know, and it's the mark of a poor writer. And the last thing I want you guys to be are poor writers. <coughs> when it comes to quoting, I'm going to have a couple of slides here about this in terms of how you quote things. <coughs> when you are looking at quoting something, <coughs> you're going to have a couple of things that you want to keep in mind. The first is that if it is fewer than 40 words, it goes as an in-text quote. Kind of like the example I've got here. Right, so I've got two quotations here. You see one begins support and accelerate innovation. 
The other one begins research, develop, and recommend. I have an open quotation mark to start them. I have a closed quotation mark at the end of the text of the quote. The in-text citation goes outside of the quotation mark. Right, so you see I've got uh, online blended and learning education, dot, dot, dot. Quotation mark, then I have the in-text citation. It doesn't go inside the quotation mark. That's a common mistake I often see, where they'll stick this parentheses stuff inside of the quotation mark. It goes outside. If you haven't used the full citation prior to the quote somewhere, that's the first thing that goes in the in-text citation. Now, in terms of a formatting, when I picked an odd one, because I actually picked the statute, so you know it looks a little bit different than what most would, but you will see that I have the, what you would normally find is you would find the author name, the date, or sorry, the author name, comma, date, comma, and then either P period and the single page that it came from, or PP period and the range of pages it came from. So if you look at the quotes that I have here, for example, this first one came from two pages. So it actually spread out over one page. It came from pages 43 and 44. So I've got PP period 4344, or 43-44. In the case of the second one, you see it came from a single page, so I just have P period 44. Here's another example. This one is slightly different because this one actually comes from an online source. So you note that there's not a page number there. There's this little symbol. Now, for those of you that... The paragraph symbol? Yeah, that's exactly what it is. That essentially is a symbol for paragraph. A lot of online publications or a lot of online sources, like if you were to take something off of a website, if you were to take something, say, off of a New York Times article that you found online, there aren't page numbers there for you to be able to find it. So what you would do is you would put in the paragraph number. So in this case, I took it off by the looks of it, a website that was from the state of Wisconsin. That website was published in 2010, and that particular quote comes from the first paragraph. For journal articles that are published only online that don't have page numbers to them, so for example, if remember with the citation, the example I had up there, it just stopped that issue number and then had a period, and then had the URL there, so it wasn't a unique page number in it. In that kind of source, I would use that paragraph marker. You know, and this is a slightly better example for that in-text citation because the author name is here. The state of Wisconsin is the author of this particular document. Because remember the last one, it was the, the statute's name was in there because there's not an individual author of a statute. So this is a slightly better example of that author, comma, year of publication, comma. In this case, that symbol for a paragraph. And if you're in Word, if you go under insert symbol, it'll be one of the ones that are listed there. I'll show you how to do it at the end of this because there's a couple of things in Word I want to show you how to go about doing. Um, space and then the paragraph number that it comes from. When you are quoting something, and either because you need to fix the tense, or you might need to fix the, um, you know, if it's singular or plural, you might need to add in some verbiage. They may use an acronym that you haven't used before, so you don't want to use just the acronym because people won't know what it is. Essentially, if you have to add anything to a particular quote, it is considered an interjection. When you do an interjection, you put that interjection in square brackets. Right? So when you see square brackets in a quote, that means that's a word that the author added. That's not a word that was in the original quote. Right? So in my case, what I'm going to guess happened in this particular instance is in the original 
it probably just said who lead. They were writing about it in the present tense. You know, because I'm trying to write about it in the past tense, because the project is now over. You know, the project was to create this. So it was for these pioneers who would lead, because I'm talking about something that happened in the past. So because I want to fix the tense of the quote, I stuck the word would in there. I could have also, instead of using the word lead, I could have changed that to led, L-E-D, and just stuck square brackets around that. Again, I'm changing the quote. I'm adding something to what was written in the original. And again, the same thing. You'll see, although again, here's another example of an error that the publisher or that the journal editor didn't catch. Here's my authors, and you'll note I have the word and there. That's incorrect. It should be an and symbol. If I'm talking about it in the text, I would use the word and. If I'm talking about it in the citation, it should be a symbol. Right? So if you remember back a couple of pages ago, because this is here in the proper text, Friedman, Darrow, Watson, and Lorenzo, it's not part of the citation. It's actually part of the text. So I use the word and. But the second that I stick it into those parentheses, so the second that it becomes part of the citation, I need to use the symbol for in. So that's something that the journal editor didn't catch. But should have been corrected from the time I submitted it. Well, most people would say that as an author, I should have caught that before I submitted it in the first place. You miss those from time to time. You know, when you're citing, you know, when you've got maybe 40 of these in an article, Missing one is not a big deal. Um, you know, you guys, when you're doing your chapter two and you've got, you know, dozens of these in your chapter two, missing one is not a big deal. That's the job of the copy editor of the journal. And my, in your case, that's my job to catch these things so we fix them before you end up with your final draft in 691. Right? But that should be an and symbol. But again, authors, comma, year of publication, comma, P period, and then the page number. So we looked at what happens when we're interjecting something or adding something to a quote. What happens if we take something out? Well, there's a couple of ways in which we can do it. You will either use three dots or four dots. You use three dots when you are just taking out part of a single sentence. So when I look at this, essentially the stuff that I've eliminated here from this particular quote, that there, basically, you can assume that it's the first part of that sentence. If I'm looking at multiple sentences, I would use four dots. So in this case, it's actually not quoting from the literature. It was the quickest one I could find last night. This is actually quoting from an interview from a student that I was taking in one of, my, um, one of the studies that I did. But you'll see down here at the bottom, there are a couple of times where I have four dots there, which means basically she kept going on and on and on. And I might have eliminated two sentences, three sentences, or I might have eliminated the end of one sentence and the beginning of a next sentence. You know, so essentially I took two sentences, the first half of one sentence, the second half of another sentence, and made it into one. That's where I use the four dots, dot, dot, dot. So if there's more than a single, if you're removing stuff from more than a single sentence, you use four dots. If it's stuff from a single sentence, you use three dots. Now, in case you're wondering what it is, um, you'll note down here on the bottom line, you see in square brackets, S-I-C. That won't be applicable to your lit review, but since it's, it's there, I wanted to mention it. When we get to 690, and particularly in 691, when you're collecting your data, essentially what that means is that either the particular word you're using isn't a word, or the grammar or the context that it's being used is incorrect. But it's a direct quote. So in this case, this particular girl said, so I just likes people reading. 
Now, grammatically speaking, that should be, I like people reading it. But because I chose to quote her exactly as she said it, as opposed to modifying the way that I wrote the transcript, I would put the bracket S-I-C. And I can't remember what the Latin word that is, but essentially it's, it's a Latin phrase that essentially indicates an error. An error in the original is what it indicates. That's not going to be applicable to you guys for the purpose of your lit review. Right? So when you get to 691, that may come up from time to time. Like, you know, if you are, for example, um, interviewing your students. Students have a lot of interjections in their speech that aren't necessarily grammatically correct. The word like comes to mind as something that gets used a fair amount. Slang terms are another one that get used, you know, particularly, you know, if I were to interview you guys, for the most part, because you understand the research process, you would be careful not to use, you know, you'd be careful to use proper language. Students tend not to be that concerned with it. They're going to talk to you like they talk to you all the time. You know, so in much the same way, you know, even just using the, the, the phrase that I just used, they're going to talk to you like they're going to talk to you as opposed to you. You know, that's an example of where I would put that bracket SIC in there if I were to transcribe it literally. Now, one of the things we'll talk about in 690, you know, are the benefits or rationale as to why you might transcribe literally as opposed to transcribing intent. For example, many of your participants, regardless of age level, will have a lot of fillers in their speech. You'll get a lot of ums and ahs in your interview transcripts. Do you want to write all of those out? And the question is, the answer is it depends. You know, and we'll talk in 690 as to times when you want that kind of information, that kind of data, because, you know, how much someone struggles to answer a question, how many fillers they need in order to get a response together, you know, that does, you know, is another one of those good fillers. That does provide you with data. But is it useful data? You know, when you look at your specific questions, does that kind of information actually help you answer those questions? And if the answer is no, then save yourself a lot of time and don't type out ah uh, and um and you know and like and all those other things that they would say to fill time as you're going through. You know, in my case, as you can see here, obviously I transcribed it exactly as she said. You know, and that was important for me for the particular study that I was doing. So again, if it's a s words eliminating from a single sentence, three dots. If it's words eliminating from more than a single sentence, um, it's four dots. Block quotes. Do you remember earlier I said that if you have a quote that is less than 40 words, it goes in the text inside of quotation marks. If it is 40 words or more, it gets put into a block quote. The way in which a block quote works is regardless of what kind of punctuation you have here, although often you will see a semicolon, sometimes you might see a dot, an eclipse, a dot, dot, dot there. Other times you might see a comma there. But from there you hit return on your word processor. You indent the entire quote 0.5 inches you'll notice there are no quotation marks. The period comes before the in-text citation. And you'll note that's different than the other ones. So if you look back to the last quote that we had, the in-text one, you'll notice you've got your end of quotation, you've got your in-text citation, and then you've got your period over here to end the sentence. In a block quote, it's the other way around. In a block quote, the period to end the sentence indicates essentially the end of the quote. And the page number, or in this case, you know, if I didn't say Wiedemeyer up here, if I had just said one theory, um, I could have just said so example, one of the major problems for K-12 students who are engaged in any form of distance education, I could have then said Wiedemeyer, comma, 1981, comma, P period, 111 there. 
because I've already provided that information up there and there's nothing in between, you can assume that that quote comes from there. And that's another thing that you do when you're writing. I actually didn't have this in um, my presentation, but it's one of the things to keep in mind. Anytime that a citation is interrupted, you need to include the full citation again. So if immediately following this quote, I started talking about Wiedemeyer again, I could just say Wiedemeyer. I don't need to say Wiedemeyer 1981. But as you see here, I've got, you know, Barber, these ones, Barber and Coos, Coos and Barber, Mulcahy. If in the very next sentence I said, Wiedemeyer does, says this, I need to say Wiedemeyer, parentheses, 1981, because there's something in between. Right? So if you're using the same author and there's no other citation in between that, you don't need to include, continue to include the dates every time. If there's somebody in between and you come back to them, you need to include the date again. We talked about this a little bit last week, um, but I wanted to include it in here because it was one of the APA ones. The use of abbreviations. As I mentioned last week, the first time that you use it, you write the full thing out and then you abbreviate. Every other time that you use it in your document, you use the abbreviation, including if it shows up in a heading. And that's an important one because a lot of people will write it out again if it's in a heading because they think it's in a heading so it's different. No. Now, what you will often find in books and in theses and dissertations is they will do this at the beginning of every chapter. That's a personal preference in terms of if you just want to do it the first time it shows up in the complete document and then use the abbreviation throughout. Or if you want to do this in chapter, you know, the first time you use it in chapter one, write it out, then abbreviate it for the rest of chapter one. But the first time you write it in chapter two, write it out, abbreviate it, and then use the abbreviation for the rest of chapter two. Either or is correct because it's all considered the same document, but in theory, you could pull out just a single chapter of it. You just have to be consistent. So if you're only going to do it once for the document and then use the abbreviation for the rest of the time, that's fine. But if you're going to do it at the beginning of chapter one and at the beginning of chapter two, you better do it at the beginning of chapter three, the beginning of chapter four, and the beginning of chapter five. So whichever model you pick, just be consistent throughout the entire document. Either or is correct. From a personal perspective, I personally always abbreviate. I consider each chapter as a separate, standalone kind of thing. So I will do this every, you know, at the first use in each of the chapters. That's just a personal preference of my own. Your own writing style and your own preferences and how it looks when you put it together, you make the decision on what you feel works best for you or what you feel most comfortable with. Numbers. This is some that some of you, as you were pre getting some of the previews, got. Um, particularly those of you that you know submitted something where the annotations were perfect, the citations were perfect, and I wanted to give you some kind of feedback, so I did this. Essentially, the rule of thumb is if it is less than ten, it gets written out. Actually, not the rule of thumb, the exact law, to be honest with you. If it is less than ten, it gets written out. If it is more than 10, it's presented numerically. So if you look at this example, what you'll see. Sorry? If it, oh, sorry. 10 or more. <laughs> 10 or more gets written out. So if it's less than 10, it's written out. 10 or more, it's numerical. So if it's a single digit, you write it. If it's multiple digits, you write out the number. So for example, 4 gets written out. 200 is numerical, 76, 35, 95, 1500 are all numerical. The only difference to that are what we would consider proper numbers or formal titles. So dates, for example, 1996. So even if you were talking about 1 AD, you would still use the number 1. You know, it's a single digit, but it's 1, you know, it's a chronological date. So if you're saying... March the 1st, 2015, the 1 is written out as a 1. Like it's not O-N-E, it's actually the number 1 because it's considered a proper date. 
The same thing when you're looking at, say, trials of something. So if you have things and the official designation is phase one, and when you actually look at the document, they use a numerical one for phase one, phase two, phase three. It's perfectly acceptable to do it that way, but in that case, you would want to make sure that when you're talking about it, that indicates to me that it's a proper thing. Why is it a proper thing? Yeah. Right? Because if I'm talking about, you know, during phase one of the thing, if I have phase capitalized, that's a formal name. Whereas if I'm just talking about the first phase, during phase one, if I write it like that, then I need to write one out. You know, because I'm not talking about a proper thing. All right, so the capitalization here is going to be key when you're looking at it. And, you know, depending on what you're doing, some of them might be, like, in the actual document that you're looking at, it might actually have phase one written out like that, and that's fine. So when you write it in your document, the P and the O are capitalized, you know, if that's the way in the literature that they're using it. Right, so you replicate that. Yeah, I mean, you have, but, again, the key is the capitalization. Like, if I see both of those things in capitals, I know that, it's a formal title of something within the program that you're looking at. If I see them lowercase, that's a descriptive term. It's not a title, per se. You know, we get the same thing with subject matter. One of the most common mistakes I see teachers making This is a subject area. This is descriptive. If I'm talking about my language arts teacher, my English language arts teacher, this is what I use. This is formal. These are capitalized, which tells me it's a formal title for something. It might be a course. So if the course is named English language arts, then it gets capitalized. If you're just talking about the subject of English language arts or the English language arts teachers at my school, this is how it's written. You know, so if I'm talking, for example, about mathematics and mathematics at my school, unless there's an actual course called mathematics, it should always be lowercase. Or unless mathematics is part of the title. So if I'm just talking about this person was a math teacher, math is not capitalized. Neither is teacher, for that matter, unless they have a formal title called math teacher. You know, like, I am the director of doctoral studies. And I just stole all my thunder from the next slide, actually. <clears throat> See, I got off on a tangent and covered off all of this. Um, <clears throat> again, what you're looking at here, formal names, formal titles. So in this case, I actually found one where education sector is actually the name of the think tank. The Canadian press is the name of the organization. Right? So those are capitalized. You know, so again, things that are formal names get capitalized. Formal titles get capitalized. The use of parentheses. This is actually one of my biggest pet peeves. People, excuse me, people who just drop in what essentially are interjections into a sentence. People who drop things into a sentence that are interjected essentially, and for whatever reason, instead of putting like a semicolon in that interjection or a comma in that interjection, stick it inside a parenthesis. A parenthesis should be, well actually that should be, according to APA, parentheses are designed to be illustrations of something. <coughs> illustrations of something essentially need descriptive terms for them. Nine times out of ten, those descriptive terms will be in the form of Latin abbreviations. The three most common that you will find, and I think there are only one up here, to be honest with you, i.e., which actually is Latin for that is. The next most common one is E period, G period. For example, probably the next most common one, although you don't see it in near the level that you would see those two, are N period B, which essentially means note well. Actually, that's the direct translation. Note de B as the... Um, 
is the Latin for it. Another NB. You'll note the format that these take. These are abbreviations. Because of that, there's a piece of punctuation after each letter. So you don't put EG period or EG comma as for example. It is E period P or G period in much the same way that you see it's I period E period here or N period B period. The only non-Latin one that you will regularly see here is the word C, S-E-E. -E. And actually some of the examples we've already seen as we go through have had that in there. Generally speaking, when you have the word C there, it's usually going to have some kind of reference after it or often a URL. So if I'm looking, let's see if I can find the last time I did it here. Um, here's a good example. You know, unlike the Alberta example, the district initiatives in Newfoundland and Labrador expanded into the current provincial school, virtual school, the Center for Distance Learning Innovation, CDO Lock. C, and then there's the reference. Right, so essentially, if you want more information about that, go find that reference. So I'm not using that reference specifically to support that statement, right? because that's the whole point of references. References essentially support the statements that you've got in there. So this reference here doesn't support this. It just provides more information about this. Right? So if you happen to be interested in that sentence right there, what that sentence says, this is going to tell you more information about it. Right? So I've got, in my parentheses, I've got C, Barber, such and such, as opposed to, say, down here, where I've just got the citation. So that means government in Newfoundland and Labrador is the source of that information. Right? So if I've got the word C there, it's additional information. If the word C is not there, it means that it is the source of where that information or that idea or that concept came from. Actually, I went backwards, and I could have just went forward by the looks of it, and I would have gotten the same thing. Um, so, you know, here's another example with the parentheses. So if you look at this sentence here, the second sentence, because there's nothing in front of that there, that means that these three citations support that sentence. But when you look down here, for example, um, here's that project advance thing that we were talking about earlier in the um, citations, and you can see, for example, so here's some of the examples of it, and then I say C, and I provide a URL. So if you want to go find out about Project Advance, here's some information about it. Same thing with the Clipper project. If you want to go find out about the Clipper project, see this URL and go to it. The same thing with the Cisco Networking Academy curriculum. If you want to find out about that particular program, go to that URL. One of the things you'll note is that when I put the URLs in there, as opposed to the uh, example I had before was C Barber 2005A. You notice there was no space after the A. With the URLs, there's always a space. Generally speaking, that's because when this does go into a PDF format, if there's a space there and I click it, it'll just give me that. If there was no space, it would try to put the parentheses as part of the URL, and when you clicked on it, it would take you nowhere. Right? So that's why the space is there. That only happens for a web address. Right, so you only add in that extra space there if it's a web address. Another one that actually APA spends a full page talking about is the use of comma which or the use of that. Essentially in a sentence they both mean the exact same thing. But there's a correct way of doing it and an incorrect way of doing it. Basically, if you use the word which, you would have a comma. If you use the word that, there is no comma. For example, if you look at this one, <laughs> down here, four lines up, the teacher also has the ability to assign students to a particular room, comma, which allows them to work in groups without the interference of audio or additional text-based discussions from members of other groups. That sentence would be just as accurate if I had said, the teacher also has the ability to assign students to a particular room that allows them 
yada, yada, yada. But if I did that, I wouldn't put the comma in there. So if you have the word that there, there's no comma. If you have the word which there, there is a comma. I have no idea why APA stresses on this particular thing, but like I say, they do make a big deal of this. So here's an example in the opposite. Stevens, yada yada, and Stevens and Mulcahy, 97, outlined a research project that used a school district intranet. Again, just as accurate would be to say, Stevens and Stevens and Mulcahy outlined a research project, comma, which used a district intranet. There's no right or wrong, and they can be used interchangeably. Just if you have a which, you put a comma. If you have a that, there's no comma in front of it. And Word will do this for you. If you actually are typing in Word and you write something or something which and you don't put a comma there, it'll actually put one of those grammatical squiggly lines underneath to indicate to you that you screwed up. Word is actually fairly intuitive when it comes to these grammar things. So, you know, a lot of the grammar cues that it gives you are ones that are actually based in the letter, you know, based upon what is acceptable within. And in all honesty, this, from what I understand, isn't just an APA thing. Uh, MLA has the same guidelines in their manual. I don't think Chicago actually mentions it all, but I do know MLA and APA both have the same guidelines on this. So headings, and I think this is the last or one of the last things I've got here before I sort of show you how to do it in the system. Um, for most of you, there are actually five levels of headings that you can use uh, that APA outline, and depending upon you know, what you need, um, personally, I've never used more than four, but this is essentially where you section things off. Now, I will make a couple of comments about the use of headings. Headings are useful for the purposes of organizing sections or subsections. You should avoid and this is actually one of the things where I would take um, my colleagues to Montreal to task on, you should avoid single paragraph sections. If the purpose of a heading is to essentially provide a thematic structure or a thematic way of organizing a section, and you're only having a single paragraph, a topic sentence will do the exact same thing. In all honesty, it is poor or lazy writing to have a heading for every single paragraph that you've got there. You know, like I say, that's one of the things I would take my colleagues to, to Montreal to task with. I think the North Carolina one that we looked at where they were looking at the charter schools, if I remember correctly, their literature review, when they talk about the four factors, they had a heading and then a single paragraph, heading, single paragraph, heading, single paragraph. So sections should be multiple paragraphs in much the same way that a paragraph should have multiple sentences. So you should avoid single sentence paragraphs. You should avoid single paragraph sections. When you are looking at the levels of headings, for your purposes, I suspect that three levels will be enough. Heading number one or the one level of heading. So if you only have one level of heading throughout, so, for example, if we were doing, if you guys were writing a journal article and all you had was introduction, literature review, methodology, findings, discussion, conclusion, implications, that's just all level one headings. Centered and bolded. And then you get your text, which, you know, is always indented. Your second level heading, so if under the literature review there were, say, three things you wanted to talk about, and you had a couple of paragraphs that introduced your literature review, and then you had, you know, a heading for each of the three things, that would be a level two heading. Bolded and flushed to the left-hand side. If one of those particular things that, you know, say again, you had three themes in your literature that you found, one of those themes had two parts, then you would move to a third level heading which essentially is bolded and indented 0.5. Left justified, indented 0.5. And then you'll notice in each instance, the text follows immediately following. It's not on the same line. If you're curious, level four heading looks exactly like this, except for there's a period after it, and then the text follows immediately behind it. 
So that would be a level four head. So it's indented one, like this one is, but there's a period and then the text follows immediately following. But I don't think you're going to run into that. I've only ever needed that in one thing I've ever written. Three is usually enough. 